Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with me for a little bit. I am so very grateful that you are here. Today we are here to do my September book of the month predictions. If you are new, this is just a fun little series that I do on my channel where every single month I come on and I try to predict what book of the month might include as part of their five to seven monthly curated selections or as potential add-on selections for that month. I break my predictions down into five different genres and within those genres I only allow myself to do five different selections. That's just kind of to give myself a boundary and also to make it a little bit more challenging. As a reminder, when I'm making my selections, I only focus on releases that are coming out for the month we are discussing. So for September, I'm only going to focus on September releases. I'm not going to look at potential October releases that could be featured in September or August releases that could be featured in September because I really have no idea how Book of the Month makes the decision on whether or not to include a pre-release book or a book from a previous month's releases into their box. I really just have no idea and that would just open the pool way too widely for me. So we're only going to be focusing on September releases. Now that all of that is out of the way, we are going to jump right in. Of course, starting with the mystery thriller horror genre category. All right, so the very first book that I want to talk to you about in this category is The Stranger Upstairs by Lisa M. Matlin. This is a debut novel and we all know that Book of the Month does like to feature debut novels and this says a social media influencer with a secret past buys a murder house to renovate but finds more than she bargained for behind the peeling wallpaper in this gothic psychological debut. So the main character is Sarah Slade. She is starting over and as the new owner of the infamous Blackwood house, the scene of a grisly murder suicide, she's determined that the fixer upper will help reach a new audience on her successful lifestyle blog and distract her from her failing marriage. But as Sarah paints over the house's horrifying past, she knows better than anyone that a new facade can't conceal every secret. Then the builders start acting erratically and experiencing bizarre accidents and Sarah knows there's only so long she can continue to sleep in the bedroom with the bloodstained floor and suffer the mysterious footsteps she hears from the attic. When menacing notes start appearing everywhere, Sarah becomes convinced that someone or something is out to kill her, her husband, her neighbors, maybe even the house itself. The more she remodels Blackwood House, the angrier it seems to become. With every passing moment, Sarah's life spirals further out of control and with it her sense of reality, though she desperately clings to the lies she's crafted to conceal her own secrets. Sarah Slade must wonder, was it all worth it or will this house be her final unraveling? So it sounds like this is going to border on the speculative or it could actually be speculative. I'm not entirely sure. This could be kind of Riley Sager-esque where you're not sure whether it's going to go one way or the other, but I'm definitely intrigued by the vibes of this story. And believe it or not, this is actually not the only haunted house book that I have on the list. So we're going to go ahead and just jump right into The September House by Carissa Orlando, which is also a debut. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw at least one of these in Book of the Month for September. When Margaret and her husband Hal bought the large Victorian house on Hawthorne Street for sale at a surprise surprisingly reasonable price. Well, there was your first clue. They couldn't believe they finally had a home of their own. Then they discovered the hauntings. Every September, the walls drip blood. The ghosts of former inhabitants appear and all of them are terrified of something that lurks in the basement. Most people would flee, but Margaret is not most people. Margaret is staying. It's her house. But after four years, Hal can't take it anymore and he leaves abruptly. Now he's not returning calls and their daughter Catherine, who knows nothing about the hauntings, arrives intent on looking for her missing father. To make things worse, September has just begun and with every attempt Margaret and Catherine make at finding Hal, the hauntings grow more harrowing because there are some secrets the house needs to keep. So as opposed to The Stranger Upstairs, this definitely is going to be speculative. There's going to be ghosts and hauntings and things of that nature. And I'm actually here for both. I would be willing to give both a try. They both sound very, very intriguing to me. And like I said, they are both debuts as well. So I would be interested to see what these authors can do. And I would be very excited to see one or maybe even both, who knows, show up for September's Book of the Month, monthly curated selections or as add-on selections. Next, I actually have a horror. It's called Black River Orchard by Chuck Wendig. I've actually heard of this author, but I've never read anything by him. This says, a small town is transformed by dark magic when a strange tree begins bearing magical apples. It's autumn in the town of Harrow, but something else is changing in the town besides the season. Because in that town there is an orchard, and in that orchard, seven most unusual trees. And from those trees grows a new sort of apple. Strange, beautiful, and skin so red it's nearly black. Take a bite out of one of these apples, and you will desire only to devour another and another. You will become stronger, more vital, more yourself, you will believe. But then your appetite for the apples and their peculiar gifts will keep growing and become darker. This is what happens when the townsfolk discover the secret of the orchard. Soon it seems that everyone is consumed by an obsession with the magic of the apples. And what's the harm if it is making them all happier, more competent, and more powerful? And even if buried in the orchard is something else besides the seeds of this extraordinary tree, a bloody history whose roots reach back to the very origins of the town. But now the leaves are falling, the days grow darker, and the stranger has come to town, a stranger who knows Harrow's secret, because it's harvest time, and the town will soon reap what it has sown. So this definitely sounds like it would be the perfect book for autumn. It is definitely giving me fall vibes. So this is certainly one to look out for in Book of the Month for September. Another strong contender 
here is The Sight by Melanie Golding, who would actually be a repeat author for Book of the Month. I will say that the early reviews of this are not great. It only has a 3.36 rating right now on Goodreads, but only very few reviews, so that could certainly change. And the tagline of this is incredibly interesting because it says that this is a chilling carnival set suspense, perfect for fans of Stranger Things. So if you love carnival set stories and if you love Stranger Things, this might be right up your alley. Look into her eyes. She can tell you how you'll die. As a child, Faith acquired the ability to see when and how people would die, a gift she neither wanted nor could get rid of. After foreseeing a family tragedy and being ostracized, Faith learns to control her visions and returns to perform in her family's traveling carnival. But when an unruly customer attacks her, she has a vision in full view of a crowd. She is banned from the carnival she loves and loses her only source of income to support her dying mother. Desperate to support her mother and with only one friend standing by her, she sees no reason to continue hiding her ability and goes to dangerous lengths to earn money. But when she sees herself in a man's future death, Faith must face her own fears of her powers and tune into her gift to fight against a future that would ruin her life and end someone else's. So again, that is a very intriguing premise. We have somebody who can apparently see how a person is going to die and now she herself is going to be wrapped up in the death of somebody else and it's going to go from there. So if you have read from Melanie Golding in the past or if this just sounds interesting to you, be sure to be on the lookout for it in September in Book of the Month. And the final one for this category that we are going to talk to about today is Bright Young Women by Jessica Knoll. This is one that was recently brought to my attention. I don't know too terribly much about it. Jessica Knoll is the author of The Luckiest Girl Alive. So if you were a fan of that one, this might be one that you would be interested in checking out. This is a very long synopsis. So I'm just going to say that this is a novel inspired by the real life sorority targeted by America's first celebrity serial killer in his final murderous spree. So I have a feeling we're going Ted Bundy here. And it says Bright Young Women is the story about two women from opposite sides of the country who become sisters in their fervent pursuit of the truth. It proposes a new narrative inspired by evidence that's been glossed over for decades in favor of more fallible headlines that the so-called brilliant and charismatic serial killer from Seattle, Ted Bundy, was far more average than the countless books, movies, and primetime specials have led us to believe. And it was the women whose lives he cut short who were the exceptional ones. So that actually sounds really, really interesting to me. This is definitely going to be based on the Florida murders of Ted Bundy that eventually got him caught and captured and executed. So I would certainly be willing to add this to my TBR and grab it in September from Book of the Month if it is featured. Next, moving on into the literary slash contemporary fiction series, we are going to start with Evil Eye by Etoff Room. I believe she was the author of A Woman Is No Man. And so she would be a repeat author for Book of the Month. This says, raised in conservative and emotionally volatile Palestinian family in Brooklyn, Yara thought she would finally be free when she married a charming entrepreneur who took her to the suburbs. She's gotten to follow her dreams, completing an undergraduate degree in art and landing a good job at the local college. As a traditional wife, she also raises their two school-aged daughters, takes care of the house, and has dinner ready when her husband gets home. With her family balanced with her professional ambitions, Yara knows that her life is infinitely more rewarding than her own mother's. So why doesn't it feel like enough? After her dream of chaperoning a student trip to Europe evaporates and she responds to a colleague's racist provocation, Yara is put on probation at work and must attend a mandatory counseling to keep her position. Her mother blames a family curse for the trouble she's facing, and while Yara doesn't really believe in old superstitions, she finds herself growing increasingly uneasy with her mother's warning and the possibility of falling victim to the same mistake. Shaken to the core by these indictments of her life, Yara finds her carefully constructed world beginning to implode. To save herself, Yara must reckon with the realities that the difficulties of the childhood she thought she left behind have very real and damaging implications, not just on her own future, but that of her daughter. So it says, it's a striking exploration of the expectations of Palestinian American women, the meaning of a fulfilling life, and the ways our unresolved pasts affect our present. So I do believe that this is a very strong contender just because, like I said, Etoff Room would be a repeat author for Book of the Month. So this is definitely one to be on the lookout for in September. This next one, I definitely also believe is another strong contender. I don't believe this author has ever been featured before on Book of the Month, but her previous book, Honor, was a Reese's Book Club selection. And so I definitely think there are high expectations for this next release. It is called The Museum of Failures by Thridi Umrigar. When Remy Wadia left India for the United States, he carried his resentment of his cold and inscrutable mother with him and has kept his distance from her. Years later, he returns to Bombay, planning to adopt a baby from a young pregnant girl and to see his elderly mother again before it is too late. She is in the hospital, has stopped talking, and seems to have given up on life. Struck with guilt for not realizing just how ill she had become, Remy devotes himself to helping her recover and return home. But one day in her apartment, he comes upon an old photograph that demands explanation. As shocking family secrets surface, Remy finds himself reevaluating his entire childhood and his relationship to his parents, just as he is on the cusp of becoming a parent himself. Can Remy learn to forgive others for their human frailties, or is he too wedded to his sorrow and anger over his parents' long ago decision? Surprising, devastating, and ultimately a story of redemption and healing still possible between a mother and son. The Museum of Failures is a tour de force from one of our most elegant storytellers about the mixed bag of love and regret. It is also above all a much needed reminder that forgiveness comes from empathy for others. So that actually sounds like it's going to be a powerful family drama. There's going to be family secrets and a lot of other complications thrown in there. So if you have read this author's previous works or if this just sounds interesting to you, I would certainly not be surprised to see it 
as a selection in September for book of the month. This next one is one that I am personally very interested in and would love to see it as a book of the month selection. It is called The River Runs South by Audrey Ingram. It says when Camille Taylor's husband dies unexpectedly, the carefully constructed life she worked so hard to build in Washington DC shatters. After struggling for almost a year, she reaches a breaking point, packs up her daughter, and heads for the Alabama coast where she grew up. The salt air and slow rhythms of the coast soothe Camille's spirit, but when she meets local fisherman Mac Phillips, she learns that things have changed in her hometown. Runoff from an abandoned development site is polluting the water, and Mac has brought a suit against the site's owners, Camille's father among them. Battling her own fears for the fragile ecosystem of her beloved Mobile Bay, Camille joins her father's defense team, but the more she learns, the more she wonders if she's landed on the right side of the fight. Meanwhile, Camille is slowly drawn to Mac's fearless resolve, his sterling ideas, and finally to the man himself. Faced with blurred lines between right and wrong, Camille must decide for herself what the next chapter of her life will bring. With timely commentary on Alabama's fragile ecosystem and exploring themes of grief, love, and community, The River Runs South will appear to Southern fiction readers on the hunt for the nostalgia of Sweet Home Alabama. I absolutely love almost everything about this synopsis. I am here for absolutely everything about this. This sounds phenomenal right in my alley. I'm getting very kind of like Kristen Hanna slash Aaron Brockovich kind of vibes, and I'm loving this. So I really, really do hope to see it on Book of the Month in September. And even if I don't, this is certainly going on my TBR. And then the final book in this category that I want to talk to you about today is called A House for Alice by Diana Evans. And this is another one that really sounds like it's going to be a drama about a fractured family. In the early hours of June 14th, 2017, the world watches as flames leap up the sides of a residential high rise in West London, consuming Grenfell Tower and many of the lives within it. Across town, an earlier spark has caught fire, a cigarette left burning in an ashtray, a table strewn with post-it reminders and old newspapers, and one Cornelius Winston Pitt, estranged husband, complicated dad, and Pitt family patriarch takes his final breaths alone. These twin tragedies opened Diana Evans's A House for Alice, an aching portrait of a family of women shaken by loss and searching for closure. At the novel center is Alice herself, the Pitt matriarch who, after 50 years in England, now longs to lay out her final years in her homeland of Nigeria. Her three daughters are torn on the issue of whether she stays or goes, and while youngest sibling Melissa also grapples with the embers of her own failed relationship, the Pitt family's foundational pillars of trust, love, and cultural identity begin to crack. Intimately drawn and set against a fraught political backdrop, yet equally full of hope, humor, and humanity, A House for Alice traces the scars of grief and betrayal across generations and uncovers the secrets we keep from those closest to us. So again, another very poignant, hard-hitting family drama, and I'm here for all the drama. All right, moving on into historical fiction. There were quite a few selections for this section. I actually had to remove a few from the list. Like I was going back and forth on what I included and what I didn't include because I had more than five that I thought would be very top contenders to be featured on Book of the Month. So I'm gonna go over the five that I have today and we'll see if at least one of them gets chosen or if they are the ones that I ended up nixing from this list. The first one is called The Frog by Zadie Smith. This is actually set in Victorian England in 1873. Mrs. Eliza Touche is the Scottish housekeeper and cousin by marriage of a once famous novelist, now in decline, William Ainsworth, with whom she has lived for 30 years. Mrs. Touche is a woman of many interests, literature, justice, abolitionism, class, her cousin, his wives, this life, and the next. But she is also skeptical. She suspects her cousin of having no talent, his successful friend, Mr. Charles Dickens, of being a bully and a moralist, and England of being a land of facades in which nothing is quite what it seems. Andrew Bogle, meanwhile, grew up in enslaved on the Hope Plantation, Jamaica. He knows every lump of sugar comes at a human cost, that the rich deceive the poor, and that people are more easily manipulated when they realize. When Bogle finds himself in London, star witness in a celebrated case of imposture, he knows his future depends on telling the right story. The Tishborne trial, wherein a lower class butcher from Australia claimed he was in fact the rightful heir of a sizable estate and title, captivates Mrs. Touche in all of England. Is Sir Roger Tishborne really who he says he is, or is he a fraud? Mrs. Touche is a woman of the world. Mr. Bogle is no fool. But in a world of hypocrisy and self-deception, deciding what is real proves a complicated task. Based on real historical events, The Fraud is a dazzling novel about truth and fiction, Jamaica and Britain, fraudulence and authenticity, and the mystery of other people. So we basically have a Victorian era story, kind of like My Friend Anna. I think that was what it's called about a woman who like pretended to be this princess or socialite and she really wasn't who she said she was. So that kind of sounds like what is happening here. So if that sounds interesting to you, be on the lookout for this one as well. The next one I think is a strong contender is The Vaster Wilds by Lauren Groff. She would be a repeat author for Book of the Month. And I'm actually kind of intrigued by the setting of this because it takes place in colonial America. And I personally don't actually read a lot of books that are actually set in in colonial America unless it features like the American Revolution or anything like that. So the synopsis of this one intrigues me. A servant girl escapes from a colonial settlement in the wilderness. She carries nothing with her but her wits, a few possessions, and the sparks of God that burns hot within her. What she finds in this terra incognita is beyond the limits of her imagination and will tend her belief in everything that her own civilization has taught her. Lauren Groff's new novel is at once a thrilling adventure story 
in a penetrating fable about trying to find a new way of living in a world succumbing to the churn of colonialism. The Bastard Wild is a work of raw and prophetic power that tells the story of America in miniature through one girl at a hinge point in history to ask how and if we can adapt quickly enough to save ourselves. I'm quite intrigued by the setting of this one and like I said I do think that there is a strong possibility it could be featured because she would be a repeat author for Book of the Month. This next one is definitely a highly anticipated release by a lot of people who are fans of this author's previous work called This Tender Land I believe and I do believe it would also be a repeat author from Book of the Month. I am of course talking about William Kent Kruger and his new release The River We Remember. On Memorial Day as the people of Jewel, Minnesota gather to remember and honor the sacrifice of so many sons in the wars of the past, the half-clothed body of a wealthy landowner Jimmy Quinn is found floating in the Alabaster River, dead from a shotgun blast. Investigation of the murder falls to Sheriff Brody Dern, a highly decorated war hero who still carries the physical and emotional scars from his military service. Even before Dern has the results of the autopsy, vicious rumors begin to circulate that the killer must be Noah Bluestone, a Native American World War II veteran who has recently returned to Jewel with a Japanese wife. As suspicion and accusations mount and the town teeters on the edge of more violence, Dern struggles not only to find the truth of Quinn's murder, but also to put to rest the demons from his own past. Caught up in the torrent of anger that sweeps through Jewel are a war widow and her adolescent son, the intrepid publisher of a local newspaper, an aging deputy, and a crusading female lawyer, all of whom struggle with their own tragic histories and harbor secrets that Quinn's death threatens to expose. Both a complex spellbinding mystery and a masterful portrait of mid-century American life, The River We Remember is an unflinching look at the wounds left by the wars we fight abroad and at home, a moving exploration of the ways in which we seek to heal, and a testament to the enduring power of the stories we tell about the places we call home. So it definitely sounds like there are a lot going on in this story. Like I said, I know this book is highly anticipated by a lot of people who are a fan of William Kent Kruger's previous work. And so this is probably the one that I have the highest hopes for, for being featured on Book of the Month in September. The next historical fiction is called The Golden Gate by Amy Chua. And it sounds like this could be a historical murder mystery. It says, in Berkeley, California, 1944, homicide detective Al Sullivan has just left the swanky Claremont Hotel after a drink in the bar when a presidential candidate is assassinated in one of the rooms upstairs. A rich industrialist with enemies among the anarchist faction on the far left, Walter Wilkinson, could have been targeted by any number of groups. But strangely, Sullivan's investigation brings up the specter of another tragedy at the Claremont, the death of seven-year-old Iris Stafford, a member of the Bainbridge family, one of the wealthiest in all of San Francisco. Some say she haunts the Claremont still. The many threads of the case keep leading Sullivan back to the three remaining Bay Bridge heiresses, now Iris's sister, Isabella, and her cousins, Cassie and Nicole, determined not to let anything distract him from the truth, not the powerful influence of Bainbridge's grandmother or the political aspirations of Berkeley's district attorney or the interest of China's first lady, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, in his findings, Sullivan follows his investigation to its devastating conclusion. Chua's page-turning debut brings to life a historical era rife with turbulent social forces and groundbreaking forensic advances when race and class define the very essence of power, sex, and justice, and introduces a fascinating character in Detective Sullivan, a mixed-race former army officer who is still reckoning with his own history. So definitely we have a historical murder mystery set in 1944 in San Francisco, and it has absolutely nothing really to do with the war, which I feel like is not only a unique setting, but definitely different for stories that are set during this time. This also has the benefit of being a debut, so another very strong contender. There were a ton of historical options that I feel Book of the Month would be very interested in, so I wouldn't be surprised if more than one of these found their way to Book of the Month in September. And oddly enough, the final one that I'm going to mention for this category also has a San Francisco setting in at least one of its timelines, and it's going to be co-authored by one of my favorite historical fiction authors, Kate Quinn, along with Janie Chang, and it's called The Phoenix Crown. So it's going to be set in Versailles, Paris in 1912, and then San Francisco in 1906. And in Versailles, at the height of an intoxicating Paris summer, a mysterious American millionaire attends a sumptuous costume ball with his bride, on whom he has bestowed the legendary Phoenix Crown, a priceless relic of Beijing's fallen summer palace. The party of the century kicks off with 300 guests, 900 bottles of champagne, and one quest for justice that spans two continents and six years. San Francisco, 1906. In a bustling city of newly minted millionaires and hopeful upstarts, four very different women cross paths. A resourceful Chinatown embroideress desperately searches for her lost love, a silver voice soprano who performs alongside Enrico Caruso, a mysteriously disappeared artist, and an independent female botanist obsessed with collecting a rare flower that only blooms at night. One man seemingly holds the key to their question, Henry Thornton, the charming railroad magnate whose extraordinary collection of Chinese antiques includes the Phoenix Crown. The women's lives are thrown into chaos when the San Francisco earthquake rips the city apart and Thornton disappears, leaving a mystery in his wake that reaches further than anyone could have imagined. So this definitely sounds certainly unique, and it's definitely different from anything I have read from Kate Quinn so far, but because she is such a stable historical author for me at this point, I am certainly willing to give this one a shot. And I wanted to mention it here because this is personally one that I am anticipating and would love to see. All right, y'all. So we are making our way to the last two categories. And honestly, I don't really have many selections for either one of them. We'll go ahead and get sci-fi and fantasy out of the way because I really only have one I want to mention. And the only reason why I 
want to mention it is because this is an author that has been featured on Book of the Month in the past. In fact, recently her adult fantasy debut was featured and I believe the book I'm about to talk about would be the sequel to one that they had featured previously. I'm talking about Foul Heart Huntsman by Chloe Gong, which would be the second in her Foul Lady Fortune YA fantasy series. I'm not going to read the synopsis of this one just because I don't want to risk any spoilers, but I did want to mention it just because, like I said, she is a multiple repeat author on Book of the Month. Book of the Month featured the first book in the series previously, if I'm not mistaken, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was an add-on selection for September. So be on the lookout for that one if you love the series and you have the first one in Book of the Month. I wouldn't be surprised if you were able to get this sequel in Book of the Month as well. And the very final category we are going to talk to you about today is romance. There are a handful of kind of interesting romances coming out in September. None of them really stood out to me as incredibly strong Book of the Month contenders, but I will go ahead and mention some of the more notable ones and potentially we could see one in September. The first one I want to talk to you about is The Wake Up Call by Beth O'Leary. Now I don't know offhand if Beth O'Leary has ever been featured on Book of the Month, but I do know that she is a pretty well-known and popular romance slash rom-com author. I personally actually have a plan to at least read one of her books this year to see if I like her as an author. So this is her newest release that is coming out. It definitely sounds like this is going to be a hate to love romance. It says, it's the busiest season of the year and Forest Manor Hotel is quite literally falling apart. So when Izzy and Lucas are given the same shift on the hotel's front desk, they have no choice but to put their differences aside and see it through. The hotel won't stay afloat beyond Christmas without some sort of miracle. But when Izzy returns a guest's lost wedding ring, the reward convinces management that this might be the way to fix everything. With four rings still sitting in the lost and bound, the race is on for Izzy and Lucas to save their beloved hotel and their jobs. As their bitter rivalry turns into something much more complicated, Izzy and Lucas begin to wonder if there's more at stake there than the hotel's future. Can the two of them make it through the season with their hearts intact? So this definitely sounds like it's going to be cute, fun, sweet, heartwarming a little bit. I'm not necessarily pulled in by the premise of it. I do love me a good hate to love romance, but for all of those who are fans of Beth O'Leary, I did want to mention this one because it's probably one of the most notable romances that is coming out in September. And so I guess it's a possibility that it could be featured on Book of the Month. I don't have high hopes for it, but I did want to bring it up in this video. This next one that I'm going to talk to you about is also set at a hotel. I find it funny that we're having a lot of duplicate themes and settings in this video. That's really, really interesting. But this is called The Second Chance Hotel by Sierra Godfrey. The tagline is, it's all fun and games until you accidentally marry a stranger in Greece and inherit a hotel because that's casual. Amelia Lang's life is kind of a mess. She's stuck living at home with her narcissistic mother. Her tech bro ex-boyfriend deliberately sabotages her at work and she gets fired after throwing a mug at his head. It's okay, she missed. Then she has a major falling out with her best friend. So Amelia does what Amelia does best. She runs away. After traveling around Europe for three months, she settles on a small Greek island to reset her life and figure out what's next. But after too much retsina, she gets tricked into marrying James, another guest at the hotel who is perfectly nice, but perfectly boring. To top it off, they are gifted the very hotel they're staying in, a hotel they don't want that is desperately neat in need of some TLC. They agree to keep the hotel open through the busy summer season for the sake of the island's corgi but well-meaning residents, after which Amelia plans to return home to start rebuilding her disastrous life. Amelia and James must work together to determine how to get out of their situation. Easier said than done for Amelia, who started to feel a strong spark of attraction for James. But Amelia is sure her real life is waiting for her back in San Francisco. Oh wow, okay, that's the third book that has a setting in San Francisco, at least partially. Is it time for Amelia to return home or could this be the second chance at a new life she didn't know she wanted? Again, this sounds like it's going to be like really fun, kind of absurd in a lot of ways. It definitely sounds like it could be a good time. So keep an eye out for that one. And the very last book that we are going to discuss in this video is actually one that I am personally intrigued by and would love to see featured on Book of the Month. It's called Witch of Wild Things by Raquel Vasquez Gilliland. I love me a good witchy story. It says legend goes that long ago a Flores woman offended the old gods and their family was cursed as a result. Now every woman born to the family has a touch of magic. Sage Flores has been running from her family and their gifts ever since her younger sister Sky died. Eight years later, Sage reluctantly returns to her hometown. Like slipping into an old comforting sweater, Sage takes back her job at Cranberry Rose Company and uses her ability to communicate with plants to discover unusual heritage specimens in the surrounding lands. What should be a simple task is complicated by her partner in botany sleuthing, Tennessee Reyes. He broke her heart in high school and she never fully recovered. Working together is reminding her of all their past tender, genuine moments and new feelings for this mature, sexy man are starting to take root in her heart. With rare plants to find, a dead sister who keeps bringing her coffee, and another sister who whose anger fills the sky with lightning, Sage doesn't have time for romance. But being with Ten is like standing in the middle of a field on the cusp of a summer thunderstorm, supercharged and inevitable. You're definitely getting some witchy vibes. You're getting some probably harder hitting elements to it. You're definitely getting a cute second chance romance. So I'm really here for this one and I would love to see it. And I'm certainly adding this one to my TBR regardless. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are the books that I think could be featured as part of Book of the Month's monthly curated selections or potential add-on selections as well. Please comment down below and let me know if there or any September releases that you believe strongly will be featured in September that I didn't mention today, I would love to know. Or if you made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me this 
like bridge, Golden Gate Bridge-esque emoji, kind of in representation of all of the San Francisco that we are seeing coming out in September. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I could do. And I would sure love to connect with you in one of those next videos. Or I would also love to connect with you on any of the other platforms that I'm a part of. I always leave links to my Instagram, Goodreads, and IG threads down below if you would love to chat with me on any of them. So please be sure to go ahead and give them a follow. And until next time, guys, bye. Thank you.